Hello. <laughs> we're Diane and Dave from Devil's Party Press, and uh, we're really excited to be part of Frostburg. It's a great uh, indie fest. We have been there once before uh, in the flesh. Yeah, and uh, it's really nice to be back again. We, we really appreciate Frostburg for doing this. Um, we are a small indie publisher, and our uh, specific focus, I guess, is that we publish people who are aged 40 and over. Um, and we do that basically because we're over 40. <laughs> you might not be able to tell, but we are, right? And uh, yeah. yes, and we really felt that we wanted to try to help people get their work out there who uh, maybe didn't get time to write until they passed the age of 40, which is definitely what has been my experience in life. Um, so we've been really lucky. We found some really wonderful authors. And this year we took a year off from publishing basically to uh, kind of retool the business. We wanna get more and more viewers for our writers. And one way we are doing that is we're having imprints that are gonna focus on specific genres that Dave and I both love. Um, we're a little bit selfish in that way. And one of the things that we love is horror. So uh, we have Grave Light Press, which is a horror imprint. And today we have three wonderful horror writers to read for you. All right, so they're going to be reading from this little um, book here called Exhumed, um, which um, was just published uh, within the last week or so uh, and is available on our website, devilsprettypress.com and amazon.com. Um, so I believe uh, the reading order will be Josephine, followed by Bernie, followed by James. So um, just a, a little bit about each. Um, Josephine uh, grew up in England and moved to the US in her early 20s and now is in the Northwest. Um, she has written a number of horror tales and uh, it was a delight to have her pen something for us. Um, Northeast. Northeast, yes, <laughs> thank you. I said Northwest, <laughs> yes, okay. Um, you'll edit that out. Um, she's worked on, uh, has stories on a bunch of websites, including 101 Words, Nutshell Narratives, and others. Um, you can also find her at josephinewrites.home.blog. Yeah. Um, you can also find her on our on the Devil's Party Press author page, and there's links to her. There's a link to her site too. Um, Bernie Brown um, has been doing a lot of writing. She actually wrote um, three stories that appeared in one of our other horror anthologies. So. Um, she is quite prolific. She's just published a novel called I Never Told You. It was released in October 2019 by Moonshine Cove Publishing. Uh, she is uh, now in, I believe she's in Raleigh, North Carolina. And she's published more than, uh, probably by now, it was nearly 40 short stories. It's probably more than that now, including essays. And, mm -hmm. and uh, she also... Um, is a seamstress and a very bad harmonica player. Um, again, you can find her at berniebrownwriter.com. And lastly, and not leastly, is James uh, Goodridge from New York. Um, James has done a lot of writing and is into speculative fiction. Uh, he is a member of the um, Black Science, Science Fiction Society. Um, for Devil's Party Press, he wrote a short story that I think you'll like um, about a very unusual pair of detectives. It's part of a series, and uh, we're hoping to have James um, bring that into a, a full collection for us at some point in the future. Yeah, we look forward, um, that. Looking forward to that. And um, you can find him. He has a Facebook group called um, What Gives You the Right, spelled W-R-I-T-E. So I would encourage you to visit that and join it if you're on Facebook. Um, he also um, does an annual series of blogs for Black Horror History Month at horroraddicts.net. So now I will um, turn it over to these writers. Enjoy. Hi. Um, so I'm reading Violet's Blossoms, a little ghost story I penned for um, Zoom. Petals drift into the table, settling on the polished surface. The faint smell of decay, flowers resting in a vase a day too long, the water starting to discolor, a woman's voice screaming, an angry cry not scared, the vase lying on the floor, water puddling between tiles, flowers strewn, stems broken, a child crying. 
The bus thumped through a pothole and Jessica woke. The dream licked along the edges of her mind, but the images dissolved quickly, like sherbet in warm water. Soon nothing remained but their aftertaste. Jessica sat up and rubbed her face, unsure if she was exercising the dregs of her nightmare or trying to crawl back into its depths. Memory, Jessica thought, not a dream, not something her mind had created, but something it had recalled. Rain tapped at the glass. The interior of the bus was hot and stifling. Condensation fogged the windows. The world beyond the glass hovered, suspended in mist. Jessica wiped at the window with her sleeve. A town beckoned, Shadow Hills. Jessica recalled a phone conversation from three days earlier when she booked her room and transportation. The charter bus stops at Baskerville, the agent had said. To get to Willow Falls in your hotel, you'll need to take a local bus. Jessica sat up in the seat and unfolded a sheet of paper she'd been carrying. Her own handwriting was difficult to read, but she made up the scrawl enough to see she was close to where she needed to be. Willow Falls was just one mile distant from Shadow Hills, much easier to get off here and walk rather than ride 10 miles to Baskerville and have to double back. She glanced out the window. The clouds looked heavy, but Jessica relished the thought of walking the mile to Willow Falls after being inert for the past 11 hours, rain or shine. It would be a relief to clear her mind of the webs of bad memories and half-remembered dreams. The bus driver didn't see it that way. I can't let you out here, love, he said. A grimace stretched across his aged face. Shadow Hills isn't a stop. Besides, there's no one here. Jessica followed the driver's gaze. The town looked deserted as if everyone had scattered as soon as the rain started like cockroaches fleeing a flashlight beam. But I'm meeting someone in Willow Falls, Jessica held up a scrap of paper as evidence. This isn't a stop, the driver said. I'll drop you at Baskerville and you can get the local from there. Jessica squinted through the rain streaked windshield. But you're stopped now, she noted. And Baskerville is 10 miles in the wrong direction. Yes, but he started. Willow Falls is a mile away, Jessica persisted. I can walk it from here. It's raining, love, the driver said, pointing at the darkening sky. Don't worry, I won't melt. Listen, love, you don't want to get out in Shadow Hills. Things happen here. What things? The driver shook his head. The door of the bus remained closed. Just bad things, he said, but he sounded tired and aware that he was losing the argument. A few passengers began to look annoyed by the delay. It's daylight, said Jessica. What could possibly happen? Can you just please open the door? Jessica was already down the steps. She hoisted her well-worn backpack onto her shoulder and turned, turned to the driver. He looked at Jessica as if she were a bad taste that couldn't be rinsed away. It was the same look her mother had given her on countless occasions. Reluctantly, the driver pulled the lever and the folding doors opened. Jessica stepped out into the rain and watched as the bus slowly pulled away. The main street was lined with storefronts, most of which were boarded up. Weeds grew through the cracks in the pavement. A cloud of failure drenched the town of Shadow Hills. Perfect, her mother's voice spoke in her head. You'll fit in well. Jessica felt as if she was being watched. The driver's warning plain with her nerves. She glanced nervously around, looking up and down the main drag, hoping to spot a warm, welcoming coffee shop or general store where she could charge her phone, get directions, grab a latte. Sunday, it seemed, was not the day to conduct business in Shadow Hills. The rain fell heavier now and Jessica began to feel that leaving the bus had been a big mistake. Jessica was sure her mum would agree. Her mum's voice, a great in nasal high-pitched tone that narrated so many of Jessica's nightmares, echoed in her head. What did you expect? You're so bloody stupid. You've never made a good decision in your life. Not true, Jessica said softly under her breath. Jessica had made a great decision just two days ago when she had finally walked away from her mother's stifling rules. Jessica touched her cheek lightly, still tender from being struck by her mother's hand. For the last time, she whispered, pressing ahead. Jessica walked along the street, trying to stay beneath the ripped and moldering awnings. A large washed out cactus stood in a store window directly across from her, doubled over as if deflated. Jessica sighed. She stood shivering beneath the meager shelter, unsure whether to wait for the rain to stop or to risk walking to Willow Falls in the downpour. A flash of brightness in the gray caused Jessica to look across at the cactus store again. The window was now bursting with colorful flowers. Jessica frowned. 
The sign above the storefront announced, Violet's Blossoms. Jessica was drenched by the time she reached the door of the shop. She pushed open the door and stepped inside. The humidity hit her first, then the scent of the flowers. It was overpowering, but not unpleasant. They're sitting in the backyard. Her mother smiles at her from beneath the wide brim of a sun hat. Her face covered in shadow, unreadable. She smells the perfume of the peonies that grow like wildfire. Her mother's wine sits unopened between them on the blanket. Jessica tells itself that when she grows up, she won't drink alcohol. The child's promise to protect, protect her older self. The shop boasted roses, roses, lilies, chrysanthemums, and many flowers Jessica didn't recognize. All were stunning in their vibrancy. A woman, voiced like honey, spoke from behind her. Can I help you? Jessica jumped and turned. The woman was young and lovely. Blonde hair tucked messily into a ponytail. Hunter green eyes peered from beneath thick lashes. Oh, I'm sorry to bother you. I was caught in the storm. Do you have an outlet where I can charge my phone? No. The woman smiled. Can I help with anything else? Some flowers for a special person, perhaps? Jessica shook her head. Your mother, maybe? The shopkeeper tilted her head. Jessica noted the fine lines around her mouth. My mother and I aren't. That is, she and I don't really get along, Jessica admitted. Such a shame, the woman said. Mother-daughter relationships can be daunting for sure. The florist turned her back on Jessica and snipped at some errant leaves in a bouquet with a pair of clippers she pulled from the pocket of her apron. Jessica glanced at the outlet next to the cash register. Clearly she doesn't want to help me, she thought, as she turned to leave. Do you love your mother? the shopkeeper asked. Her back remained toward Jessica, who blanched at the question. The shop was warm, much warmer than the bus had been. Jessica was suddenly aware of the rivulets of sweat running down the back of her neck. Well, she said, starting toward the door, I should probably be going. Sorry to have wasted your time. Oh, don't leave, the merchant said and turned suddenly. Jessica stepped back, almost toppling a pile of pots stacked behind her. It's such a nasty, gloomy day out there. At least wait out the rain inside. Jessica wondered how she had mistaken the woman as young. Her hair was streaked with grey and the wrinkles around her mouth were deeply grooved. I'm Violet, the woman said and offered her hand to Jessica. The skin on her liver-spotted hand felt paper thin and oddly cold given the temperature of the shop. I'm Jessica. Jess for short, Violet asked. No, said Jessica, I prefer Jessica. Right, of course you do. Jessica noted the cynicism in Violet's tone and pursed her lips. The same tone her mother used with her, a mocking, passive-aggressive sound that always precluded a tantrum. Look, I just want to charge my phone, Jessica said. Since I can't do that here, can you at least give me directions to Willow Falls? To where? Violet asked. She was occupied with arranging a flower vase. Jessica didn't notice the petals which were brown at the edges or the leaves that drooped thirsty and dying from the stems. Willow Falls, Jessica repeated. I've never heard of it, dear, Violet started humming a whispering nasal tune. It's the next town over. No, the next town over is Bradbury. It's Willow Falls. I saw it on the map. I once had a daughter, you know, Violet said. She was a tart too. Jessica pulled her backpack further onto her shoulder. The door seemed a mile away. Violet now stood between her and the fresh air of the steadily darkening morning. Yes, Violet continued, a tart. Daughters are tricky, you know, slippery things that twist your words and force your demons to the surface. Violet smiled, brown teeth lined black gums, and not even the hyacinth and lilac could mask the stench of rot that seeped from her. Jessica took another step backward. What's your mother's favorite flower? Violet asked. Her voice was hoarse like a smoker's rasp. A peonies, Jessica said, trembling. The stench in the shop was now malodorous, but underneath Jessica picked up the faint hint of her mother's perfume. There was a rustle as leaves and petals dropped to the floor. The smell of decay pushed through the perfume and Jessica wrinkled her nose. Violet skittered across to Jessica and touched its tip. Funny little wrinkle nosed chipmunk, she said. Jessica's heart lurched. I'm going to pass it over to Bernie Brown now. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to read for you The Doggone Ghost. Marvin Trulove prided himself on his small feet. In fact, he fussed over every detail of his appearance. 
as head salesman in men's suits at Clark's department store, Marvin maintained a high standard, the likes to which he hoped his clientele would aspire. <clears throat> Attention to detail also marked the care Marvin took within the department. Each morning, Marvin arrived early to ensure that each suit was properly buttoned. He also arranged stray suits, making certain that they all faced the same way on the rack and hung in ascending order of size. The morning of May 31st was no different. Marvin surveyed his sartorial kingdom with a pride seldom seen at the store. Everything in men's suits stood ready and waiting for a banner sales day, or did it? Marvin's instincts twitched. Like beacons, his eyes scanned the, the sales floor. Not one speck of dust remained on the rack top displays. The shoes were polished and shone like mirrors. The socks display created a rainbow of color. Yet despite this perfection, the thin hairs on the back of Marvin's slender neck stood at cautionary attention. Something was amiss. Marvin checked the aisle that separated suits from athletic wear. He swiveled his neat little neck all the way down to outerwear and back to the changing rooms. Nothing unusual to be found. He slowly walked up and down each aisle, checking between racks. All was well. At last, he reached the aisle that led to the elevators. His inner alarm sounded loud and clear. Something was not quite right. In a moment, he knew what it was. Oh, doggone it, Marvin said. That was the harshest expletive he would allow himself. Doggone it, doggone it, doggone it. He ran a finger under his shirt collar, which suddenly felt too tight. It had happened again. Alarm mounting, he hurried to the display next to the elevator bays. For the third time this year, the suit on the meticulously dressed mannequin, a double-breasted Yves Saint Laurent cotton wool blend, <clears throat> cotton wool blend adorned with matching shirt and tie, had been replaced with something entirely inappropriate, a bikini. In fact, it was the yellow polka dot variety popularized in that dreadful Brian Highland song from Marvin's youth. The prankster had even stuffed several pairs of Calvin Klein socks, one of the most expensive lines, into the top to provide the mannequin a most unwelcome bus line. Marvin rushed to the storeroom to fetch the, fetch the stepladder and undo the culprit's handiwork. Marvin hastily redressed the mannequin. He was desperate to complete the task before the store opened and Mr. Durleth, the tightly wound display manager, made his morning rounds. Marvin recalled the, the pranks from earlier in the year. In February, the mannequin had been dressed in a sequined thong, the type Marvin thought were completely inappropriate and ought to be declared illegal. In early April, it had been a skirted design. I'll bet that stock boy Weasley is to blame, Marvin had complained to management following the second incident. I scolded him for his sloppy unpacking, to which he told me to go to, Marvin hesitated, H-E double hockey sticks. Couldn't have been Weasley, HR sacked him a week ago. You weren't the only one to complain about him. Marvin couldn't imagine that anyone else would hold a grudge against him. He barely socialized with his coworkers. He ate lunch in the break room alone and away from the others and abstained from caffeine, thus having no reason to socialize on a coffee break. He had only ever quarreled with one other person at Clark's, though that was years ago, back when Marvin was a lowly stock boy. He disliked thinking about that. It had ended badly. There, finished and with no time to spare, Marvin patted the elevator mannequin's expertly tied necktie, descended the stepladder, and hurried to return it to the stock room. Marvin hated the stock room. Mysterious pipes and cables crisscrossed the cavernous, cavernous ceiling. Metal lamps hung up there amidst all the apparatus, probably as dusty as the Sahara, Marvin thought. The doggone place is just plain spooky. A scraping sound emerged from behind a stack of boxes and Marvin shivered. He quickly hung the stepladder on its hook and returned to the comfort of the sales floor. Clang. He jumped and then turned to see that the ladder had fallen. Must not have secured it. He rehung it, this time making certain it was secure. 
Marvin rushed to leave. Clang, clatter, the stepladder fell again. Marvin glanced over his shoulder. Tattletale, tattletale, hanging from a bull's tail. The voice came from behind those boxes and sounded vaguely familiar. Who's there? Marvin called. His query was met with silence. Oh, just leave the dog on ladder on the floor, he thought. Perspiration gathered on his forehead. Marvin patted it with his neatly folded pocket square and quick, quickly left the room. Marvin nearly skidded to a halt by the elevator mannequin, just as Mr. Durleth made his rounds. I like this suit, true love. I might buy one for myself. You would look very distinguished in it, sir. Marvin hoped Mr. Durleth didn't notice that he was panting like a marathon runner. Stress made Marvin's heart beat irregularly, too. He took quinidine for arrhythmia. <clears throat> the day passed without further incident. The store's Memorial Day sale didn't break, didn't break any records, but a nice stack of receipts filled the accordion folder under the counter. At nine o'clock, Marvin checked the dressing rooms for merchandise, turned off the lights, and hoped that the elevator mannequin would remain properly dressed overnight. Thoughts of the one man who might hold a grudge, might wish him ill, crept into Marvin's head. Marvin True Love's mind was too tired to keep them out. On several occasions in the early 1960s, during Marvin's years as a stock boy, he had encountered Harvey Bustard, the head salesman of men's suits at that time, behaving inappropriately with Ethel Fairweather, a formal wear. On numerous occasions, Marvin had nearly tripped over them in the stock room, their arms wrapped around each other like twin boa constrictors. Marvin recalled the time the staff elevator doors opened to reveal Bustard's disgustingly pimpled backside, Miss Fairweather pressed against the wall. Then there was a time when he'd heard their passionate cries, moans, and grunts escape from one of the toilet stalls in the men's room. By late 1967, Marvin could take no more. Marvin had reported his observations to the human resources manager, a most uncomfortable conversation. It happened that the brother of the HR manager was engaged to Ms. was engaged to Ms. Fairweather. Word got around and both Fairweather and Bustard were let go to pursue other opportunities. But all that was so long ago, Marvin reasoned. Water under the bridge, bygones being bygones, forgotten down memory lane, or was it? Marvin suddenly recalled the long forgotten handfuls of anonymous letters he'd received in the mail almost immediately following Bustard's determina termination. Each one handwritten on Clark's department store stationery. Tattletale, tattletale, hanging from a bull's tail. A chill, <clears throat> excuse me, a chill sh shot through Marvin's body as another realization surfaced from the recesses of his mind. He's dead. Miss Fairweather's fiance shot and killed Buster point blank only weeks after learning about the affair. At that moment, Mar Marvin turned as a shadow caught his attention. He stared dumbfounded as the tweed three-piece suit he was about to rehang, a Marvin Brothers Martin Brothers design with suede elbow patches, puffed up, puffed up as if Griffin himself, the ill-fated protagonist in H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man, had stepped into it. The chest expanded and the arms took shape, flexing to display the elbow patches. Soon after those arms pushed aside the gabardine navy and the gray twill, the legs took form and the entire suit stood tall to stretch its tweedy arms. It had shape and bulk like a man, but was devoid of flesh. No bespectacled professor's head gave the garment dignity no hands extended from the sleeves to sport an old class, old school class ring. Only floor existed where brogues might have completed the look. Marvin stared, half convinced he was dreaming, but the fluttering rhythm of his faulty heart convinced him otherwise. The living garment approached Marvin and swatted his cheek, the wool scratchy and dry. Marvin backed away, staring a fierce flush rising where he had been struck. He was struck again, harder this time, but still little more than a slap. The force surprised Marvin and he stumbled backward and nearly fell to the floor. His weak heart responded, thump, thumpity thump, thumpity thump. 
The suit lunged for Marvin. He turned and ran. If you want to know how it ends, get a copy for yourself. Now, our next reader will be James. Thank you. Okay, the name of the story is The Stumpville Affair. Prologue. The new cycle of a full autumn moon casts a cold, icy glow over August Mason's farm. Mason woke at 3 a.m. to the sound of his livestock. While the old farmer hated to venture out at this, at this hour, he needed to find out why the hens were riled. Stepping out into the darkness, thoughts of Deacon Talbert, the local priest who had recent, be, recently been murdered in the early morning hours, sent a chill through Mason's body as Wellington boots crunched atop the frosted grass as he walked to the barn. Something's got them hands worked up, said Mason, buttoning a denim pea coat. Brown earth mixed with manure caked his work boots as he rushed to the hen house. Hatless, Mason cupped his eyes, avoiding the moonlight's glare, as his brightness made him nauseous. Stumbling upon the hen house, Mason blindly felt around inside the wall, eventually locating a pair of dark tinted welder's goggles a memento from his days in the Navy during the Great War. He slipped them over his cow-licked auburn hair. Now, what got you ladies cackling about? Where's Muggsy? Mason wondered out loud, inquir inquiring about his king rooster. He suddenly felt the presence behind him. The hens felt silent and almost human-like terror. Stepping out of the hen house, Mason, a loner with no wife, of chil wife or children, turned around to face what was going to end his life. The creature snapped at him, raised his sharp fangs, bit into Mason's right arm, snapping it off at the elbow. Blood, bone, and muscle mass splattered about in the moonlight. Mason's lower arm sailed end over end into the air, finally landed atop the weathered house roof. As shock set in, Mason howled in pain, body quivering. His eyes reverberated into the village of Stumpville before trauma took him into eternal darkness. Just before dawn, the day laborers Mason had hired approached in a dirty pickup truck. As the headlights grew nearer, the creature which had been feasting upon Mason's crimson and pink flesh vanished into a nearby tree line. The hens had remained the hens which the hens which had remained silent resumed their frenzied cackle as Muggsy the rooster emerged from the crawl space beneath the hen house. Times were tough, even for a coke detectives. Our clientele whose high society money bags, our, our clientele those high society money bags who hired Sue and I to chase ghosts or perform tire readings had dried up as a reliable source of income. Contract work for the city's paranormal office of special concerns had slowed because of budget cuts. It's Tuesday, 12.35 a.m. Dressed in striped azure PJs and my red smoking jacket, I was in for the night. I sat behind my desk rolling around a nice-sized emerald from my stash on a desk bottle, wondering how much it might fetch off in the distance, a tugboat horn mewed deep on the Hudson River. At least the tug captain had work, unlike the occupants of Riverside Drive and 107th Street. A mug of high sub tea on my desk curtailed my cravings as the silence of the moon was suddenly interrupted. I answered on the first ring. Hello, Kirkland, I said aware that only Stuart Kirkland, a young boy, won the head of the old SC, was the only person who could call me at this hour. How goes it with you? Hey, Madison, old pal, it's, I'm peachy. Listen, I know times are rough all over with this depression crud going on, so I figured you and Sue might be available for a job. Much appreciated, I said. Besides, this one's on, this one's out of our jurisdiction. 
What's the affair? I asked, intrigued. Upstate New York, Sullivan County, village of Stumpville. The local sheriff, Kilroy Bertrand, has two unsolved murders, which he believes were committed by, well, a werewolf. The sheriff's a real forward-thinking fellow, I chuckled. How did he decide to reach out to you? You remember the life of a lichen? That monograph you co-authored with Sue? That's right. He used the nom de plume. She's used the nom de plume anonymous. Bertrand read it. He thinks anonymous can solve their problem up there because anonymous must be a werewolf to know so much, said Kirkland. <sighs> to me, that monograph was nothing but trouble. So what's Bob looking for? A lichen to catch a lichen? I guess so, Madison. He sounds desperate. Yeah, but I'm also desperate for, for people not to know Sue's propensities, I warned. Okay, Kirkland, I'll ask Sue. She was under the weather last night and retired to bed a few hours ago. It's her call. Fair enough, Kirkland said. One question, the village of Stumpville. Is this a sundown town? Persons of mixed heritage like Sue, half Negro, half of Native American, half Negro, and I, half Negro, half white, knew better than to work where we weren't wanted. Money tight or no money tight. I'm ahead of you, Madison. Bertrand says it's an all-American progressive town. They even have a few farms in the surrounding areas run by people of color, B. Kirkwood. With that, I pulled out a yellow legal pad and pencil out of my desk drawer and took down the sheriff's information. I'll phone you later in the morning after I speak with Sue. Good morning, Kirkland. Good morning, Madison. I pulled out an old gold from my cigarette case, then it would have been gentle gold from my left hand palm and took a quick food puffs before snuffing it out of my tea mug. I left the smoking room and headed upstairs to Sue's apartment on the second floor unlocking the door with her spare key. Seek meth, sweetie, what you doing, gal? Hanging upside down from the ceiling, Sue's pet cat, Seek meth, meowed. Jet black fur tapered up to five silky black tentacles, which held it in place, while her forepaws played with a pink, pink ball of yarn that trailed down to the floor among Sue's kaleidoscopic colored hair pillows. pillows. Three innocent, competent feline eyes blinked at me. Come on, gal, I ordered, to which she plopped down on my shoulder, paws and tentacles secure in a piggyback ride to Sue's bedroom with me. Sue lay sprawled out, face down in a black nightgown, throat rasping and sniffed a sign of cold emotion. Sue, Sue, wake up, love. I think I've got a plain affair for us. Interested? I knelt beside her bed and tapped her arm and Seekman hopped on my love's back, doing her best cat shimmy to break Sue's slumber. <sighs> Madison Prescott Cavendish, do we have to talk now? Sue asked, voice syrupy from, voice syrupy thanks to, thanks to her cold. On one and more, on one, on more than one occasion, my Sue had been mistaken for Harlem starlet, Freddie Washington even being a standard for the actress during the film shoot. But at this hour, rolling over to see me kneeling beside her and feeling Seekman's resting on top of her stomach, glamour was not on my beloved's mind. Job, what, what, what is it, where? I don't feel so good. How much does it pay? It's upstate, Stumpville. I have a phone call. I have to phone the sheriff in the morning if we take it. What, what's he want to say on Sue Sniff? He, um, um, he wants us to catch a werewolf. Sue sat bolt upright. Come again? A werewolf, I repeated. Sue's pupils turned from black to hazel. Even her happy freckles, as I like to call them on her beautiful face, were becoming inflammatory with anger. Seriously? She asked. I kid you not. According to the lawman, this werewolf has already munched two people to death during a full moon. 
as I'm sure you know, the full moon is in cycle this week. I figure we go up there, catch the creature, detain it till morning, then give it a one-way ticket out of town. No sore feelings. I know you were looking to celebrate Halloween, but we need the dough. Sue frowned. What if it's a werewolf like me? My mind flashed back to 1914, a nameless cosmic horror whose encounter in a lower Manhattan basement had changed our lives in ways we couldn't have imagined possible. I guess we'll see what happens when we get to the to that bridge, my love. So how about it? Let me sleep on it, Maddie. Looking around but finding nothing upon which to wipe her runny nose, my suit playfully ran it across on my pajama sleeve as Sigma's tentacle tapping displeasure on Sue's arm. Good night or good morning, dear, said Sue, rolling over to return to dreamland while Sigma snuggled in her arms. I quickly retreated back downstairs to await her answer. And to find out her answer, you got to get exhumed. That was great. Thank, thank you, James. And, and thank you, Bernie. And thank you, Jennifer. And there's Josephine. Thank you, too. Yeah, so I, I suppose all that's left is for me to say thank you to each of you as well uh, for reading from the stories. Uh, definitely, I'm looking forward to reading this book. So thanks so much for being along with us.